Hi, this is Serena, founder and director of Breaking Taboo. Today I am sitting here with Dr. Regine Galanti, who has a PhD in clinical psychology and she has a private practice in Long Island, New York. You have some specialties that you work with, right? And one of them being OCD. And um, mm -hmm. am I missing anything else? So I work with OCD, anxiety, children and teens, really all, all like the entire age span, but I specialize in anxiety disorders and OCD. Great, great. So that's something that's going to be really interesting for us to chat about. Um, it's very common. Anxiety and OCD are uh, some of the more common uh, mental health conditions. And I'm very curious because um, there's a huge spectrum of uh, OCD and anxiety. Um, some people experience, you know, um, paralyzing anxiety. And some people have OCD that's so bad that they can't even leave their homes. Um, and then there's your, you know, more uh, functional <laughs> sides where, you know, um, some people just have panic attacks every now and then. That's, that used to happen to me in high school. I've experienced a, a couple of panic attacks myself. And then um, OCD, my OCD goes as far as just, you know, checking my alarm clock a lot <laughs> or, or my, my locks. Not, it's not functionally impairing. <laughs> So I think, you know, I, I have never sought out therapy for it. I think, I think I'm okay. I'm on the more normal spectrum. I think everyone has a little bit of OCD and, and anxiety. But um, uh, what are some of the cases that, that you see that, that brings people into getting therapy um, for OCD? I think it's really a huge spectrum, like you were saying, super common. So like one in three people over the course of their lifespan will be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. Um, OCD is like one in one to two in a hundred, which might sound like a small number until you think about like, well, I normally say the last time you were in a room with a hundred people, but <laughs> that is probably <laughs> way more in the past than it normally is. But like when I'm talking to a teen, if you have 200 kids in your grade, that's talking about four kids with OCD. So, um, it's a high number. Um, and what I look for in my practice is functional impairment, or I guess what finds me in my practice is functional impairment. People like you are not going to come in because it's not bothering them. <laughs> right, right. I mean, it, it might, it, yeah, I remember um, um, my uh, ex-boyfriend would find it humorous, you know, but that was pretty much the extent of it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, versus like, if you are not going to be able to sleep, because every 20 minutes you wake up and you have to check the doorknob to check if it's locked, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, um, it's getting in the way of your life. So, um, and I think people have this image of like, OCD is just hand washing, like it means I'm washing my hands a lot. Um, but it really can take a lot of different forms um, from kind of checking or counting to um, having thoughts that you have stuck in your head that you want to kind of get out. So you tell yourself something to get it out. Um, so like, you're like, well, I won't, I don't want to get into like, you have this thought, maybe I'll get into a car accident. So you think to yourself, okay, I'm going to, it's okay that I'm not that that I'm having that thought because I've never got into a car accident. But you say that in a way that if you don't say it in that exact, that like words, then you're sure that you'll get into a car accident and you have to repeat the phrase over and over and over in your head. Interesting. Um, and, and that's pretty common, right? I mean, I, that makes me think of uh, way back when I was in fourth grade, a friend of mine was just doing this like little, it was just like a little mind game she was playing with herself. And then I started doing it as well. Um, but she was like walking on this line in the middle of the hallway. And then she was saying like, oh, I'm doing a game where if I don't do this, if I step out of the line, then something bad's going to happen. But if I make it all the way to the line, then like this, this good thing is going to happen. And I thought, oh, what an interesting game. So so I actually did a, 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 some similar games um, like that, um, but, uh, you know, it was never debilitating or anything for me, but that, that kind of reminds me of that, where, like, it's almost like mind games, but, like, on a more serious level where they really believe that something bad is going to happen, right? If, yeah. If, yeah, if, like, a small thing like that is, is not exactly the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, and it could be something random. Like, it doesn't have to seem like it's connected to you. If my stuffed animals are not in a certain line on my bed, then my parents are going to die. Like, okay. <laughs> like, yeah. um, I actually knew someone who um, 
uh, was uh, traumatized by the the Bible and um, at a very young age, and then later on developed uh, OCD with numbers. So um, you know they had to count to like three or seven or something, and and you know uh, I remember him saying that he had to go up and down, um, you know, on a like looking at. Uh, uh, shower curtains or something like three times or seven times or yeah. it was always in like multiples of threes or else something bad was going to happen to his parents or he was going to go to hell or you know something bible related so how how does trauma tie into OCD does it tie into OCD so it well the first part that you're saying about the the kind of, kind of traumatized from the bible is uh there's a type of OCD called scrupulosity so it's religious OCD but it's different from religiosity because religiosity typically comes from a place of like spirituality and belief like hey I, this is what I want like and I feel connected it makes you feel better about yourself in the world versus scrupulosity which that religious OCD it's kind of when like OCD hijacks um, or religion in a way that makes you think like, well, if I don't do this, then I'm going to hell. So I need to do this perfectly when most religions are much more forgiving about things. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not, and actually OCD is not more common in religious people. People will ask me that all the time. Like people who kind of adhere to certain rules, you might think, okay, well, that's OCD. Let's not. Um, like so, what's the difference adhering to what type of rules? Um, uh, because I'm not, I'm not that familiar with, what type of rules would uh like if um the bible says you have to avoid certain foods so like you know if you're keeping kosher and do you need oh, to okay. avoid um meat and dairy together that's a religious rule okay fine like that's fine what ocd will do is say well but i know you just said cheese but are you sure it somehow didn't come into contact with meat maybe in the fridge they got mixed and you didn't see it and you didn't notice, and now you need to separate, you need to clean out your whole fridge, you need to make sure everything's different. So it takes the religious rules and it hijacks it in a way that's really functionally impairing and gets in the way. So mm -hmm. like it takes, actually a lot of times what OCD does is takes what's important to you, what you value, and it hijacks it and makes it scary. So you love your parents, so now you're thinking about them dying all the time. Mm, um, how interesting. Okay, wow. And is the religious aspect common in OCD? It's, it's, it, it's kind of common. <laughs> and oh. Among religious people, I think it's more common if they have OCD for it to have religious themes. Because again, OCD latches on to what's important to you. So if religion is important to you, then a lot of times OCD will have religious themes. But if your family is important to you, you might be afraid of hurting them in some way. Or, you know, if your health is important to you, then all of a sudden we all have a little bit of that, like, kind of, but I like to think of any mental health issue, any disorder is a spectrum. So on one end, you have normal intrusive thoughts, which is like thoughts like, like I'm in New York. So, um, you know, maybe I'm going to jump into the subway platform before the train comes. Like either I pick up something up, maybe I'll drop my phone and I'll think about jump, jumping in to get it. Or What is that? Is that just impulsive thought or would that be OCD? That's an intrusive thought. Mm -hmm. like just, we all have them. Like mm -hmm. I, yeah, all parents have them. Like, oh my God, what if my kid ran into the street and got hit by a car? Sorry, right. they're all morbid, all the ones I'm coming up with. <laughs> right. No, I've experienced that too. I've experienced exactly that thought that, that um, and, and it was really scary, exactly the thought of the subway. And then for a while, I actually could not go to the train station um, by myself. I had to go with someone because the thought, it was just really scary. I was afraid for some reason I would do that, you know, even though logically it made no sense. So I actually um, got hypnotherapy for it. And then I got, cause I thought, you know, it was, it was um, something that I had to like, you know, reprogram my, my thought pattern. And then we did some um, interesting uh, safety um, hypnotherapy things where like you take, you take a scary situation, you place it in a safe situation. So it was very interesting. It was also like a interesting, um, experience, experiments, <laughs> learning experience for me. But, um, yeah, that's so interesting. So are you saying that uh, people with more severe OCD tend to have those thoughts also? It correlates, right? Well, it's actually intrusive thoughts are a giant part of OCD, but everyone has them. Everyone mm -hmm. has intrusive thoughts. 
It's more, what do you do about them? In your example, it's a perfect example of like, you have that thought like, oh my God, maybe I'm going to get hit by a train. And then you stop taking the train, which reinforces that thought. It tells you, oh my God, that thought is true. Because mm -hmm. if it wasn't true, then when I, why would I be avoiding the train? So right. you have that obsession, that thought, which again is normal and everybody has them and they're, you know, just a weird kind of blip in our brains. Mm -hmm. But then if you start acting on them, then you kind of make them more real and then you start avoiding more things, which makes it even worse. Oh, interesting. Um, so what would be the, the best way to deal with, with an intrusive thought like that? So actually, the kind of therapy I do, I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist, so mm -hmm. I do a lot of exposure therapy. So this is going to sound ridiculous, but what, what I teach people to do is to face their fear, right? Right. Take the train 20 times, because when you do the thing that thought's telling you not to do, and then the thing you're worried about doesn't happen, it breaks, severs that connection. It's a very... It's confirming learning experience. Like, okay, I was sure the train's going to hit me, but now I've taken it 20 times. Nothing has happened. Hold on. Maybe my thought's not true. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. No, I, it's like desensitization, like with phobias, uh, obviously, mm -hmm. and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, people with um, uh, severe phobias actually go through um, actual you know, um, very immersive, almost like virtual reality desensitization steps where, mm -hmm. um, where they're forced to be exposed little by little. And then, and then like, finally, boom, they, they, um, uh, touch the actual spider. Right. Um, but, uh, uh, however, that's not so easy. That's not so easy no. to do when someone <laughs> is really, really like almost deathly scared of something. Because I remember getting in conversations, um, uh, about this in my past also um, with someone I knew who who did have uh, some issues like this and um, and you know it was just uh, a really it was like a very difficult conversation because that person just does not want to do it you know they will just avoid it like the plague so, yeah well that's you can't have anxiety without avoidance because mm -hmm. if you're anxious about something and you don't avoid it you'll stop being anxious about it Right, um, right. So, so what what would you recommend um, in that case if uh, if someone just just does not want to do it? So, no one wants to face their fears. That's the whole thing. Their fears—they're <laughs> terrible to face. <laughs> right. um, but I think any good exposure therapist, any good CBT therapist, will be able to work with collaborative collaboratively with someone to be like, okay, like. We're going to get there, or we won't even talk about how we're going to get there. We're going to talk instead about the tiny, teeny first step. Like, we don't have to touch the spider. We just have to say the word spider out loud. Like, that's what we're up to today. And, like, right. make a dent. And then kind of, I, I believe very strongly in showing patients the process. Right. So saying, okay, we're just, we're just taking a tiny little step. And I'm never going to make you do something that you don't want to do. I'm never, my example always in my first session is like, yeah, if you're afraid of dogs and I lock you in a room with a dog, you probably should fire me as your therapist. Oh, yeah. That's not an ethical thing to do. But eventually, you'll stop being afraid of that dog. It might be like hours later. But if I say, you know, uh, you're there all day, eventually, you're going to learn that dog is safe. Other mm. dogs might not be. But, you know eight hours later when the dog hasn't bitten you or barks and you get used to it and you're like, okay, like this is, this is just what it is. Mm -hmm. You'll be okay. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't do that. Right, <laughs> right. But speaking of, I know a lot of people um, are with OCD, a common one is cleanliness, right? Mm -hmm. And um, um, uh, so, I mean, where, like, where does it become actual OCD versus, you know, just being really clean? So my question is always, does it bother you? Like, what happens if things are dirty? I like things to be clean. I, I get that. Mm -hmm. But if the table is dirty, it's not going to, I'm not, I'm going to be able to work anyway. I'm going to be able to say, okay, tables, actually the table my laptop is on right now. I definitely needs to be Windexed. I look at it and I'm like, ah, I need to Windex it. But it's not m making me like sick to my stomach that it's not clean. Right. Um, 
Okay. No. Interesting. Right. Right. So as long as it doesn't impair any other aspect of, you know, normal functionality. Um, but what about, uh, I've also noticed, you know, sometimes um, uh, people with OCD, they'll go to a restaurant and they have to like move all the all the things and you know make a perfect little square or whatever it is you know they have to like separate them into certain sections um so what's up with that what is that all about <laughs> so i think you just hit on another subtype there's a mm -hmm. bunch of different subtypes one is symmetry so like putting things in a certain way and that way can depend on the person and depend on a bunch of different factors but mm -hmm. um you know i'm working actually with a very I've, I've worked with a very little girl who just didn't even know the difference between evens and odds almost like, but she needed things to be even. She'd say, if I do something with one half of my body, I need to deal with the other or it feels icky. Um, mm, right. So it was almost like this very, like, it's not always a cognitive thing. It's much more an emotional thing of like, I just, it doesn't feel right. Um, I see. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Huh. So then they just end up carrying that feeling with them all day and it just feels like gross or really bad or just unsettling and they're unable to fully concentrate on anything that they're doing. Unless they do it. Like, mm. unless they like, you know, tap, tap or whatever it is. Right. It was, yeah. So I'm thinking of one patient I had who didn't even realize, like she came in for a different, I don't remember what she came in for, but in the course of talking, she realized that whenever she sits, she has to make sure her body like kind of lands evenly on the chair. And if mm. not, she'll stand up and sit again. Um, Interesting. So where does um, OCC, OCD, sorry, um, OCD, where does it stem from? Um, because uh, I remember learning that it's a form of control. You know, a lot of times these, these um, uh, uh, disorders or conditions are, you know, stem from feeling a lack of control, feeling like you want to control certain things a certain way, and then, you know, later on it turns into um, like, a, a, like a small habit that turns into a bigger habit that kind of spirals from there. So uh, how much of it would you say actually stems from a, a desire to control um, their environments or things that are going on in their life? Well, I think part of a lot of anxiety disorders are about uncertainty, right? We don't like uncertainty. No one likes uncertainty. Think of coronavirus, right? Like, I want to know what's going to happen in September, October, like when I'm going to be able to socialize normally with people around me. It's uncomfortable to not have that. So mm -hmm. that idea that you're talking about, like wanting to control something that you can't makes you feel a lot better. Well, it doesn't make you feel better because it doesn't work because you can't control it. But if you could control it, it would be really effective. I know that for me, like during hurricane season, if there's like a hurricane, like in my neighborhood or whatever, that's something I get anxious about. And then all of a sudden I find myself wanting to like do things that I have control over, like bake, mm -hmm. because at least then like the cookies <laughs> will come out the way I want them to. I can't control the weather. There's a lot of uncertainty there, but I can control something else. So Sometimes, often with anxiety and OCD, you're trying to create certainty in a situation where you can't be certain. Because even if I tell you, hey, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that you're wrong, often what people will respond is like, yeah, but what, are that what, what about that 0.1%? Like, you know, mm. and I can't convince you. Like, you're right. There's always a chance. And if we dwell on that tiny, teeny chance that something bad will happen, that chance kind of like, it's much bigger in our brains and takes up a lot more space. Right. Um, right. I mean, I'm sure there are those like very rare cases where something bad does actually happen. And then I'm sure that's like extremely traumatizing and would just imprint, um, you know, whatever uh, OCD habit in their brains even more so. So have you ever gotten a client well, like but that? Often, that's, I guess, what you were saying before about like what the role of trauma is. Right. In I, I hear how that would be, but actually because OCD is pretty irrational, it, mm -hmm. it's not correlated with trauma. Oh, um, interesting. Trauma is kind of a different thing. It's when something bad happens, you have this anxiety response. It's a very normal response and kind of disconnecting from just your environment because you need to process that trauma. And if you don't kind of integrate it into yourself, then it causes kind of psychological damage. But OCD is not like that. It just seems like you're born with this predisposition to seek out um, 
like to, to have these intrusive thoughts and to act on them and try and control them. And also, um, you know, we know that there are definitely things you can do to make it worse. Like mm. if you build on, like if you always do what your obsession tells you to do, it's mm-hmm. going to be a lot harder to fight, fight it versus if I teach a parent of a three-year-old the right thing to do, it's easier for that kid to then sever the connection in their head. Oh, how interesting. So you don't think, so OCD is not like just triggered by some, an event that happens in life or, uh, and then that can, you know, make someone want to uh, develop uh, a certain amount of control and trigger, say like o- OCD or even worse OCD symptoms. Um, you don't think that could happen? I, that doesn't the typically doesn't, happen. Yeah, the research doesn't actually support that. I know how it kind of logically makes sense. I know people have yeah. this, you know, they want to well, know just well, I've, why. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just because I've, I've, I've uh, seen cases like that. But then I, I think, uh, you know, I might just logically in my mind, just like link it. Oh, that might be why. But it's interesting to hear that actually, no, that's actually not usually the case. So OCD then is just a predisposition, you're saying? Yeah. And then, and then what just makes it worse is just, you know, whether or not you follow that instinct or that habit or not. Mm-hmm. How interesting. So it's just basically like a personal choice that, you know, is there? I think that makes it too too easy. I don't think it's a personal choice. I think you're just like the same way we're born with certain tendencies, like that, like obsessive nature is something that some people are just kind of born with and you do naturally what makes it better, which is you do the compulsions, the things that your obsessions tell you to do and that makes you feel better. So you keep doing it, except that you end up kind of stuck in this loop um, indefinitely if you, mm-hmm. if you, if you, if you run things like that. So right, it, right. So do you think like if people knew this, um, would they be able to be more conscious of, uh, of these habits and, and, um, be able to, I guess, control <laughs> their <laughs> own, uh, their own, um, OCD so that it doesn't go down, uh, uh, an even, um, a bigger spiral or do you think it's hard for them to even be able to control that in the beginning? I mean, well, I think it's hard what, for, you yeah, know, what advice would you tell someone who might be like, just like right there, we're feeling like they're, like maybe they're not um, funct- functionally um, impaired yet, you know, to the point where it's disturbing their life. But let's say someone is born with some of those symptoms. What would you tell them? So I think that the, one of the problems that you, you probably face is that it often comes up in childhood it's not impairing till later necessarily Mm -hmm. but you know if this was something that came up when you were 18 21 25 then yeah okay great we can I can say let's do this but the problem is that these are habits that start young so telling people to be aware and on the lookout for things when they're like 11 12 13 years old is a little bit of a losing game but in theory if I could (laughs) what I would say is um, what I actually what I tell parents all the time is you need to learn best practices to not feed your anxiety. So mm-hmm. you feel like the best thing to do here will be just all I have to do is just wash my hands for 30 more seconds and then I'll be OK. And your job is to wash your hands for 20 seconds and feel uncomfortable and see what happens. Because I know you can handle it. I know we'll be fine. But you don't believe that that's true. <laughs> Is that what you tell your, um, your clients is like just, you know, for example, if they have to wash for 30 seconds, you'll give them a homework assignment to, okay, only wash it for 20 seconds this week and then report back to you. Yeah. Or even 28. Right? Can they like do it? Anything. <laughs> well, I would never, I try very hard not to give any homework that a patient can't do. Right. Then I set myself right. up for failure. So it's, again, very collaborative. It's like, how are we making this decision? Like, how are we deciding what we need to do and like what steps you're willing to take in Mm -hmm. session outside of session like if you're telling me like you know i'm unwilling to to do this then i'm not going to say go ahead and try (laughs) and be like let's do something else (laughs) so interesting wow wow um okay well uh on to uh, the subject of anxiety, uh, especially right now during COVID, um, I'm sure you're experiencing, especially in your clients, also a lot of uh, increased anxiety because of COVID and all the things that we cannot control right now, right? So I know the world is experiencing that. We've gotten a lot of uh, comments, you know, um, ourselves and people, you know, uh, dealing with anxiety. So 
Um, what are some great CBT uh, steps that you can recommend people for um, uh, dealing with anxiety right now during COVID? So I think that um, one of the biggest, but also pretty hard um, things that I've been telling people is focus on your current state, focus on today, tomorrow, next week. Don't think about the thing that you were planning on to doing in January, uh, whether or not it's going to happen, because you can drown in that. Um, if you're making a decision about, let's say, going on vacation, but you're not sure if you're going to be able to, because it depends on, let's say, the rates, where of the place you're going, or anything like that, think about when you need to decide by. So if it's two weeks from now, then you don't decide. You spend the next two weeks not planning to go or not go and then you sit down um, and you make that decision in two weeks but spinning until then is super unhelpful <laughs> yeah um, yeah absolutely focusing on the present and not the future um, yeah. because we can't control the future anyway like I always say yeah. we have no idea what's gonna happen um, right. Uh, so, um, have you noticed, uh, like, a, 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 a significant increase in, in um, uh, OCD symptoms in your patients now because there's more anxiety? Um, I think so, but it's also, it makes sense because there's so much, again, uncertainty, but also a lot of, like, hand washing and opportunities for feeling like you might get sick. So, mm -hmm. um, I know that I and almost every therapist that I know is swamped now also. Um, and no one has kind of room for new patients. So that tells us, at least anecdotally, that like rates of anxiety seem to be on the rise. Like everybody's dealing with something. And it makes sense because if you had any predisposition for anything, coronavirus made it worse. <laughs> Stuck at home, <laughs> right, a lot right. of uncertainty, a lot of fear. <laughs> Right. That is so interesting because, yeah, there are, I never really thought of um, the, the whole hand washing thing. We're supposed to do that even more so now. We're told to do that. So I'm sure people that have that as one of their OCD symptoms, and it's, it's a fairly common OCD symptom, right? Washing of the hands, cleanliness, um, cleaning, all of that. So um, yeah, that, that does give them more opportunity, right, to indulge in some more of the uh, uh, OCD symptoms that they already have. So how are you dealing with that right now? Are you just basically telling them the whole, you know, um, let's lower the, the amount that you're doing it, let's lower the, the amount of seconds? I mean, are you finding like they're, it's a bit difficult right now, more difficult to treat your clients because of what's happening around the world? So if you ask, in, ask me in March, I would have said yes because then it was really like, we didn't know, like I, you know, what we used to do for exposure for cleanliness is I'd be very comfortable telling someone like, okay, don't not wash your hands. Do you know how many people don't wash their hands and we still don't get sick? Like, right. it's disgusting. Like I happen to like having clean hands, but like, you know, people do it all the time. And if you tell me don't wash my hands, I can survive. And then it went from that to wash your hands for 30 seconds or else, or you're going to kill your loved ones. And then we're all washing our hands, right? <laughs> Though my hands are raw, I really went from like, you know, pretty minimal hand washing to pretty extreme hand washing pretty quickly. But what I, now the rule the rules that I often come up with with my patients is we choose an expert. We choose a doctor, an infectious disease specialist, whoever it is that they trust, and we go by their recommend recommendations. So if it's washing your hands for 30 seconds after the bathroom and before eating, then that's what we do, but we don't do anymore. Then the goal is to get right down to the recommendations, no more, no less. So I don't, especially, well, for anyone, OCD, um, tries to keep people more safe than they need they need to be mm. but um so the goal is to maintain safety um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so if hands washing is what we need to do to be safe we do that but also recommendations change so if you ask me in april like is it okay to wipe down your mail i would have been like yeah but now it turns out that it seems like it's unnecessary so now the goal is if someone has ocd and is cleaning their mail the goal is probably going to get to to move them away from that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What if they're following, um, say, certain political figures who are not uh, uh, necessarily doctors? <laughs> 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 Do 
just curious, <laughs> like, what would you, you know? So it's funny, because so... I guess what I would say is, you know, like, you choose your expert. And if the, if your like, expert. What if that's your ex expert? Yeah. <laughs> is a politician who I don't agree with, I guess I'd be okay with that as long as I was doing telehealth and not in person. I think in person, I would feel like I don't want you to put me in at risk. So that's okay. But like, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that. I mean, telehealth is so convenient now nowadays, you know, I think it's it gives people even more reason to find a therapist. Um, you know, some people are, are afraid of uh, looking for one right now, because they think, Oh, how, how am I going to go see one? What's telehealth? Is it going to work? But it's actually really great. It's actually really convenient. And I think, you know, there's nothing really to be afraid of. And uh, how would you I mean, do you think that um, you can do an equally pretty much, uh, you know, good job over telehealth first, uh, versus if they were to come into your office? How has your experience with it been? So I was actually doing, I guess, telehealth before it was cool. Um, I see a lot of teens. I wrote a book for anxiety for teens. So it's definitely kind of um, in my purview. And teens, even if they were local, would sometimes be like, oh, I'm just so tired. Can we just like... <laughs> <laughs> can we can we do online like can we just FaceTime I don't want to have to right. come to your office and then they have their stuff they're in their comfort zone and you know that was always fine for me so um you know, used I to FaceTime yeah they're yes used they were to at the beginning it was a learning curve for me because I'm like really don't you want to be face to face and they're like no no I want to <laughs> be in my room <laughs> I do not want to be face to face so then when uh you know I my practice went from basically probably 85% in person, 15% telehealth to 100% telehealth very, very quickly. Um, I, I was definitely hesitant, like how it was going to work for people. But it turns out that there's a lot of flexibility that, um, I, that happens in telehealth that couldn't happen in my office. Um, mm -hmm. With the exposures that I was talking about, it used to be like, we plan in my office, but then they'd have to go home and let's say, do the contamination exposure, like touch something, then touch something else. And I'd kind of have, I, I'm very open with my patients. They'll text me and I like to hear from them about how they're doing throughout the week. But um, I, I'd wait for that. And I'd be like, oh, how's it going to go? I hope it's going to go well. But now in the middle of session, we can be like, oh, that's our plan. Let's go do it. Like, come on, take me to the kitchen. Let's see how this goes. Oh, how interesting. Um, so you're actually able to do the steps with them and walk them through it. Yeah. So they have even more support. Okay, well, that's great. Yeah. That's, that's even better, it sounds like. Yeah. And also so, flexible scheduling. So, like, right. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me about one of these exercises. Sounds very interesting. What is a contamination exercise? Oh, so like um, I was reading, let's say, a woman who was, um, her OCD was related to, um, it's funny because I guess pre-corona but she was afraid that touching food would give her HIV mm. um so could be that someone bled all over her carrots in the grocery store and she didn't notice and then she brought them home and she's going to touch the carrots and she's going to get HIV um and she'd constantly be moving food like this food goes in the garbage this food like she'd buy things and then not use them mm -hmm. so our goal was to um eat the contaminated food um oh. So How, was that difficult to uh, get her there? How long did that oh, take? So it actually, she was someone that in person we'd set up like really specific homework. She'd say she was going to do them and she would not do them. Right. Because <laughs> she's probably afraid. Yeah. Yeah. So it didn't so matter you... how she'd say, I'm, I'm not afraid. I just didn't have a chance and I couldn't find the carrots and something like that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but then we actually switched to telehealth. And I was able to say, okay, well, we're going to go and we're going to get the carrots from the fridge. And I was able to also moderate to be like, whoa, it's even making you anxious to open the fridge. So we're mm -hmm. just going to open the fridge. Like we're going to stand here and look in your fridge, like at the things that might be contaminated. Um, Interesting. And that ended up being a step kind of in the process. Interesting. Um, and do you have any insight on um, how these links are formed? I know we spoke about a little bit of before about the religious one of if someone's raised religious, like they'll have religious OCD patterns. But um, but what about some a case like this? Like, for example, something like HIV plus carrots, you know, how is that formed? <laughs> oh, I think it's more like if you think about it, like people are afraid of HIV or cancer. We get the health ones a lot. Um, 
you're a person who's concerned about your health. You want to have a long, like, wonderful life. And instead, all you can see is the way that ways that you're going to die and your life is going to be impacted. So it just maps itself then on everything. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's not specifically carrots. It's also all other vegetables, the milk, the this, the that. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But, yeah. like, why something so specific, though, you know? Um, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how does that get formed? Do you have any uh, theories or insight on that? But we don't really know. I know I can tell you postpartum OCD is a thing that people don't really talk about. Oh, um, please talk about it. <laughs> Let's break that taboo. <laughs> the postpartum depression people hear about these days, which is great. Like, right. you know, women are more susceptible. But it turns out parents, fathers also are more susceptible to OCD in, oh. yeah, um, after they have a new baby. And first of all, hormonally, women are a mess. So um, that's a ripe opportunity for some of this mental health stuff to creep in. But um, it also is just a very new phase with a lot of intrusive thoughts. Like when you hold a new baby, like when people hold an infant, it's very normal to have thoughts like, oh my God, this baby is so small. Like I can just drop them. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, right. Yeah, that can be very scary. Yeah. And then as a parent, like a new parent, what do you want to do is you want to hold your baby closer. You want to protect them. Mm-hmm. And then it and some of these behaviors as a new parent is very normal. Let me check on my baby, make sure they're breathing 700 times a night, even though I woke them up and now I feel stupid. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, um, so, so uh, postpartum uh, OCG is what is just like uh, obsessive checking in on the baby or obsessive so it's worry about the OCG that comes out mm-hmm. normally centered on the baby, but it can be centered on kind of anything that right after you have a child um, mm-hmm. or in the year after you have a child that was never there before because typically OCD comes out younger, like uh, by the time can, you're like a teen. Um, uh, and this can be, uh, you're saying either mothers or fathers. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So even oh. a father can be like, you're, you're holding your new infant and you have these intrusive thoughts and you start acting on them. Mm. I think the problem that we find in OCD is when you act on those obsessions, so it's not that the obsessions are the problem. Our thoughts are thoughts. We have random thoughts. They happen all the time. Like, mm-hmm. you know, if I think to myself, the sky is purple, it doesn't mm-hmm. make the sky purple. It's just a thought. Mm-hmm. But then if I you started know, doing, I don't know. I don't know what I would uh, do for that. <laughs> you know, I think, um, yeah, well, I, I was just thinking about my thought and what I shared with you earlier about the train thing. And I remember that when it did happen, it was so shocking for me. And it was such like a, oh my gosh, that I think that was the thought itself was like traumatizing and, and shocking. But what had happened right before that, and maybe that's why, because I link my own uh, thing to trauma, but what had happened right before that was that um, that was when one of my friends had jumped off a building and um, killed himself. And I had never been afraid of heights before that in my life. I had never you know had the had that thought before ever and then all of a sudden it's like boom it's just like crept in and I know you know that's something a little bit deeper that's like something like suicide clusters type thing you know or there were um, but also it's a stress point as a friend like right. now you're under a tremendous amount of stress and that's just you can imagine like you open the door to just any of these other things that opportunistically pop in your head like and not you. That's that felt blamey. I want to take that back. It oh wasn't. no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just that's what happens to us when we experience positive change in a case of like having a new baby. But like you know, coronavirus works like that. Like uh, a friend suicide would definitely work like that. It just opens this kind of mental door for anything that you might have been fine if that event didn't happen. So I yeah, guess I think that's the trauma I was talking about. Like maybe, yeah, opening a trauma, like opening up the door for more thoughts or just random thoughts that you never had, you know? And I'm just like, where did these thoughts even come from? You know, it's like, I never thought of this, but I, I understand. I understand. It's just, it's the whole, you know, the, the jump thing, the height thing, like it makes sense, you know, um, somehow it got associated in my brain, you know, somehow yeah. it, it got stuck there because it was so traumatizing for me to think about, I think, you know, that it was just there. Um, but I want to, I actually want to talk about, uh, you mentioned teenagers and anxiety, right? You wrote a book on it. So there's a lot of anxiety in teenagers, right? I mean, teenagers, of course, deal with so many emotional changes all the time and, 
you know, I remember when I was a teenager, boys and, you know, it was like all the, like going to and friends. And, yeah. And friends, social. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. So <laughs> I can, I can understand it can be definitely stressful. Um, but uh, yeah. Can you speak a bit about teen anxiety and teenagers specifically? So I, I think you just hit the nail on the head, like boys, like that, that social element of like, where do I belong is just like, do you think of like, no, very few people will look back and think that was an easy stage in my life. Oh, that was so simple. Like, and now add to that, like, like knowing what everybody's up to at any point, because you can see it on Instagram and, you know, like everybody's hanging out without me, like just turning up the dial on that. And um, uh, teen anxiety is just very present, prevalent. Um, is right? that just That's because, is that just because of our physiology and our, our biology and our, you know, our, our brain structure when we are teenagers that like we tend to feel anxiety more, you think also on top of everything, like maybe um, um, we're just more susceptible to just like I, we're more susceptible to emotions. <laughs> I think that's what you hit the nail on the head. We're just more susceptible to emotions. So we're going to feel it more, even mm. though it kind of settles. Like, right, your brain is just in a, in, in a very intense place when you're, in a teen, when you're a teenager. You're developing. You're turning more independent. There's a lot more opportunities to just um, be anxious and even have that anxiety be normal because the anxiety is a normal emotion. Like, it's happy, sad, mm -hmm. worried, like worried is in there. It's totally fine to be worried, but there's just so many opportunities for that to rear its head because am I wearing the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Am I having the right friends? Am I going to get into the, the right college? Like <laughs> all those questions are like very normal. Um, yeah. Yeah, everything affects you so much more as a teenager. And it also um, doesn't look always just like anxiety. Like, yeah. teenagers are irritable. Like, sometimes they're, dep like, when a teenager is depressed, they're much more likely to present themselves as, like, this, this irritable, like, like, grump than looking sad and crying. Right. So you don't right. always see it also. Like, parents don't always know what to look for. For. And teenagers don't always know what to look for because, again, they have so many changes. Like, oh, this is not normal. Like, panic attacks are not normal. Panic attacks are not normal. Most teenagers don't have them. Like, mm. sucks that panic attacks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember I had to get sent to the nurse once. <laughs> <laughs> it was like things were just getting really dizzy and then I was like oh yeah but that was my you know that was my panic attack when I was a teenager but what would you recommend for teenagers um to uh deal with their anxiety you know it can it it, it often feels so so much more you know when you're yeah. a teen so how can they deal with it so honestly, therapy is great. Um, <laughs> of course. And of therapy. I like to recommend it. I also think though teenagers, like you're gonna talk about like like stigma, like teenagers in their heads, they always think they're the only ones. I have in my practice, often I'll like not on purpose, but I'll end up seeing people that are friends who will say mm. things like, I am the only one I know. <laughs> with this issue and I'm like no honey <laughs> you're not even the first person I spoke to today with this issue <laughs> wow. um yeah is there a lot of OCD in teenagers um I it's pretty much the same like uh you're talking about one in a hundred okay is it um, does OCD correlate with age at all it's so it tends to come out around like 11 12 13 or like 15 16 17 so around that like you're seeing it in teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, and then later on, um, do you see more cases of OCD like later on or is there like it more? Like a peak. Okay. It's not like one of those things. That I, I guess trauma would be one of those things that just can happen at any time at any age. Right. It's dependent on an event. OCD seems like there's a genetic piece, so it tends to come out um, like around teenage years. Yeah. Interesting. It's, again, Interesting. super fun. Like you're dealing with all these changes and puberty and everything. And now you're also obsessed. <laughs> like you have these obsessions that you didn't notice for the first time. Yeah. So that's wow. Wonderful. <laughs> Do you think it's um because you said that it is so dependent on, you know, um, uh, catching the thought uh, and, and not indulging in it. So is it more difficult to treat clients with OCD, like the older they are, like the longer they've been, um, doing these repetitive patterns? 
Um, definitely not the older they are, but the longer they've been doing these repetitive patterns. It depends. That's kind of why I like to see younger um, oh, I see. <laughs> people because I like to be able to say, like, okay, like, we're really preventing this from being a thing that takes over the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. I know we touched upon a little bit before, but um, uh, what is the correlation? How much of OCD is phobia? And like, you know, again, like where, where do you draw like the difference between like, this is phobia and this is OCD. This is uh, someone just being scared of HIV versus um, uh, like so someone, or, or it does it go hand in hand, someone with OCD so phobia who's is scared of it? Generally, right. For OCD, you're having these thoughts and then you're doing something about them to try and make them better. So I'm having thoughts like, hey, um, you know, like, I don't know, um, uh, my hands are dirty, so I'm going to do something. I'm going to wash my hands. Or I'm having thoughts like, oh, I'm going to contract HIV, so I'm going to avoid the food that would have given it to me. Um, or There's like a second, like a second element to it. Like they're going to do something to control it. Yeah. Right. Phobias don't have that. It's just avoidance. It's I'm afraid of spiders. I'm done with them. It's not necessary. It doesn't have that ritual piece. Mm. So, um, right. A little bit, um, you know, kind of more like one, only one piece. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Afraid of something specific, typically storms or animals or um, needles, high places. Um, yeah. Think- those are the big ones for phobias. <laughs> Do you get any like um, particularly interesting uh, OCD cases? Actually, just for our audience out there, what are some? Um, what are some? Um, just give an example of uh, different cases of OCD um, that that you have experienced. Like how wide it can it can range. Um, so it's really super wide. I you know often it's um, I love this this sounds pretty morbid, but I actually keep a set of knives in my office because often um, one area that I tend to, I guess, treat a lot is people who are afraid of harming themselves or harming someone else. But it's different from depression. This is not suicidality. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they end up in the wrong, let's say, ER or the wrong doctor who gets afraid that they're talking to someone suicidal. And it actually um, makes it worse for those people because it convinces them that they must be suicidal. But really, it's almost like a fear that they're suicidal. They don't want to kill themselves, but they're afraid that they might. So they, let's say, um, avoid knives, like won't cut salads. Because then if I'm holding the knife, maybe I'm going to want to kill myself. But Mm. they're not depressed. And there's Mm -hmm. no desire to take their own lives. It's literally just an obsession that maybe I'm going to, maybe I will want to kill myself. That's like like an impulsive thought, right? Yeah, that intrusive thought again. Intrusive thought, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but but then uh, what's the OCD element to that? So they'll avoid. So they will let's say not put themselves anywhere around any knives or. Um, that so, sounds like a uh, almost like a phobia though. But it's uh, yeah, but the avoidance is even like more than a phobia. It's not like they're not afraid of knives. Like mm-hmm. phobia would be if I was afraid of knives and I got it. Ran got it from a knife. Like it's like it's my like fear I is wasn't of the object. Um, right. Yeah. It's like I wasn't afraid of the subway station or the train or anything, but <laughs> yeah. that, that one intrusive thought was just in my... Would you say that that was OCD? That seems like an OCD kind of thought. Oh, how know. interesting. Was- oh, <laughs> oh, maybe you just diagnosed me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm in a good place with it now, um, uh, although I do have to admit every now and then I do actually still get it. And I'm like, okay, you know what? It's like, it's safe. It's okay. I try to like think of my, uh, my uh, um, uh, hypnotherapy session, but um, it's very interesting. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I, n- I hadn't correlated that with OCD at all. So because I wasn't doing something ritual or repetitive. That was the element that was missing. So I did not think it was OCD. But you're saying that it could have been like things like that also. Like the avo- like when, yeah, when you avoid, well, when you're saying I need to bring a safe person with me, when I need to not go on the subway again, like, you're, again, like the reason why it's not a phobia is because you're not afraid of the train. Right. You're afraid of a no. dog. You're afraid of a hurricane. You're afraid of a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, here you are u- using avoidance to kind of achieve the goal of, you know, I, I, was I don't do this anymore. Of action. Yeah. That made no sense because, yeah, it yeah. wasn't suicidal. It's, I wasn't. Obsessions that, make so. no sense. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. How interesting. Wow. Okay. 
Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So, so then, okay. So then, um, uh, what would you tell, uh, your client in that case? I'm not, I'm, I mean, we don't have to use me as an example. As a no, well, I've treated that before. I started my, my practice in the city. So people being afraid of the subway, like come in, you know, Oh, really? Okay, so yeah. what would you tell them? Yeah, we, we work on it, right? Like, I have done sessions, like, in this disgusting, like, subway stairwell, like, sitting there just like we watch the trains go by, often it's, will I jump? So, like, you know, we're going to stand first on the stairs, and we're going to see what happens. Let's see if we do it. Like, mm-hmm. or then we'll go to, I remember, I don't remember what the differential was. I was treating someone with OCD related to something subway, and the... I guess there was a claustrophobia element to it. So the underground subway stations were much worse than the elevated ones and some like some of the subway stations more towards Brooklyn or more above ground. So we started with those. We met on the subway platform and like we just stood there for like 45 minutes until until basically you get bored. You're like, okay, what am I standing here for? Like nothing's right. happening. Okay, fine. And then <laughs> right. and then the next step would be, let's say, getting on the subway. And like then the next step might be standing in a platform underground. Um, Interesting. I mean, again, reminds me of phobia, reminds me of desensitization with a phobia, I think. So yeah, they are like, it's, it's interesting. They're different, but they're yeah. very similar. We treat them in the same ways. way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, treat, I treat both. So it's so more, then, how do we help you face this? So let's, okay, so for example, um, in the case of, let's say, someone having to move things around or making things perfect, um, uh, you know, all the time before they can do work or eat or whatever, you know, I'm just saying, like, that, yeah. you know, if that happens, well, you, what you would do is desensitize them to having to uh, have that control. So you might be like, uh, would you say something like, okay, what if you didn't um, move this element today? And then the next, uh, next day or yeah. next week, like, or don't plant it on purpose, do it, undo uh, it. Ah. I hate that. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna. I was just thinking they must have a very difficult time doing that. Well, sometimes it's we're gonna keep that slanted, but for thirty seconds, and let's see if you can handle it for thirty seconds. Oh my god! Right? It doesn't yeah. have to be forever. You know, we'll build it. Like it's. I always tell my patients it's a marathon, not a sprint. So if it takes us a while, you've been dealing with this for how many years? It'll take us a while. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Fascinating baby steps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like as long as we're in the right direction, who cares how long it takes? Right. I'm treating someone now who's like, you know, afraid of his parents dying, but he's been afraid of it for the last 20 years. So like, you know, we literally had to start with me saying the word death, bring them out. Like just really? even saying, oh, so you're afraid your parents will die. Like I'd see like... The super anxiety response was like even saying the sentence, he just avoids it in his head. So the first step was just even like listening to it. And then like even the next step was saying death related words out loud, disconnected from many people like in his head. Um, so it's like so. a lot. Yeah, I can definitely see how CBT uh, would obviously help because it all has to do with thoughts, like just the, the repetitive thoughts and then the thoughts of the phobia and thoughts of what would happen, <laughs> indulging yeah. in those thoughts. And yeah. But so. also here's the situation. What am I going to do? I'm not exposing you to your parents' death. I'm not going to kill your parents. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I think it's um very uh, interesting nowadays with, with this whole like law of attraction, you know, um, type thing, like, like, if you think something, it might happen type thing, you know, or like, uh, or uh, the school of thought, like, you, we are what we think, which, you know, I do believe those in to some extent, but um, I can see why that would be extremely detrimental for people that are with OCD, especially. With yeah, but actually, like mindfulness in general, this idea in psychology of like Mm -hmm. you're not your thoughts and we can change them and we can well we don't even have to change them because they're not you they're just part of you that kind of floats around and you can choose whether things are important or not yeah that is so interesting because most people uh associate themselves with their thoughts and their feelings i mean we're not even our feelings and we we have things happy always say honor your feelings but at the same time we're not even our feelings, you know? So, but that's like very difficult for a lot of people to comprehend because that's all we know. That is what we know of existence. All we know is what we feel and what we think. So how can we not be that? Right. So that's, so yeah, I guess. And I love that honor your feelings. But one thing I tell my patients all the time is kind of like honor your feelings, but you don't have to act on them. 
<laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Recognize your thoughts and then choose which one to, or which one's indulge in. And that is way easier said than done. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For everyone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, amazing. Okay. Well, um, is there anything else that you would like to add, um, especially during our times right now of COVID um, to our audience? Um, just that there always are resources available that, you know, if you think that something might be a problem or you might be dealing with anxiety or OCD, there are resources. You're not alone. Like one of my favorite resources is um, the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, which is abct.org, has a fantastic Find a Therapist page and a lot of links for help. Um, but that there are people who are doing what you're doing and I guess what I'm doing, like, trying to help other people find help so mm -hmm. um yeah mm -hmm. just the and help is not up. a bad thing it's just like people have always think that help is a bad thing but honestly like you know we all help each other all the time anyway you know there's, there's no other way to survive in society um that's what we're supposed to do so you know Learn to yeah. see it as a good thing, not a bad thing. So mm -hmm. I think that's key. Anyway, thank you so much, Dr. Regine Galanti, um, the specialist in OCD and teenage anxiety. Um, she wrote a book. What is your book called, by the way? Um, anxiety Relief for Teens. Okay. Anxiety Relief for Teens. Thank you so much, doctor. And uh, have a wonderful day. I hope everyone out there stays safe and um, works working on, we're all working on our stress relief and our anxiety relief. We're all in this together. So stay safe, stay healthy, and I will see you soon. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.